to the press uh, availability for the Senate minority. This is the 43rd day of the session. As you know, we're approaching mid-session now. Time's beginning to tighten up a little bit. Um, as I want to thank you all for being here because I know we're in the midst of debate right now on the House floor on the budget. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is probably the earliest in recent years, at least in the last decade that I'm aware of, that the House has brought the budget to the floor this early. And uh, I believe that they're going to be done fairly soon and that we'll likely see at least as early as Friday, if not uh, by early next week, that budget coming over to the Senate. appreciate that the House went to such extensive efforts in trying to get this budget resolved early and over to us so that we can work on it. But deep down, the budget asks and answers the same question. It's how do we pay for the services that we need in this state, which... Uh, especially in light of ensuring that we have the health and safety of all Alaskans in our consideration. You know, we've, um, over the past week, I think you have all are quite aware of the volatility, not just of the stock market, but of oil prices. As of Friday, the oil price was at $48.33, which you may not be aware of, but it's fallen under $50 now. Usually in the past, when the price of oil has fallen, the stock market's gone up, or when the stock market has fallen, the price of oil has gone up. That is not the case now. Yesterday, while the market jumped about a thousand points, as of just a few minutes ago, it's nearing a thousand uh, loss, and so that's just an erasure of the gains. I think the Midnight Sun just reported over three billion dollars out of that three point eight, I think, billion dollars out of the permanent fund in just the last week. So these are significant things. It underscores one thing in particular, and that is Alaska must have financial stability. We we are in a situation where we're dependent on the stock market and oil prices for virtually everything we do. This caucus has said over and over and over again that there must be a plan. We aren't always in agreement on the details of that plan, but the con concepts and the principles are something we are in agreement on, and there are four. There must be meaningful contributions from the oil industry. There must be new sources of revenue. We must ensure that the permanent fund is protected and we must be sure to provide for a meaningful dividend because that is the essence of how we control the permanent fund and ensure that it's sustained. So with that in mind, we know that the what the Senate minority has done is we've continued to put bills out to address each of these areas. When it comes to oil and gas industry, Senator Wilikowski has a number of bills dealing with oil and gas tax credits, but also with capturing the Hill Corp corporate income tax, that $30 million will be lost to the Treasury because Hill Corp is an LLC, so it wouldn't necessarily fall under the corporate income tax. That bill would actually ensure that that revenue isn't lost. Um, I put a bill in to tax oil and gas property that would generate around $284 million in income and after tax deductions closer to $200 million into the Treasury. Other bills are out there as well. We've We've tried to provide different balances for how you could calculate a dividend. We've tried to put those on the table for our colleagues. We've looked at um, ways to uh, identify new sources of revenue. The three of us have all supported an income tax, which is not even in discussion mode at this point. So what, what we have done as a minority is the most that we, by law, can do. We're not the majorities, but we have laid out areas, talking points, areas for people to have discussions to try to get to a plan. And we are supporting our colleagues in the Senate as they wrestle with the issue of a plan and are watching the House to see what they develop here over the next week and then what they offer onto the table. But with that, I want to get a few comments from my two colleagues here. I'm joined by Senator Olson from uh, uh, Northwest, from the Northwest part of the state, he represents the Northwest part of the state, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of the revenue measures and other issues that are out there, and then Senator Keel represents uh, Juneau and Southeast, uh, Northern Southeast, we'll talk about some of our budget priorities specifically around the operating budget, and then we'll open it for questions. Senator Olson. Thank you, Senator Begich. This uh, financial situation we find ourselves in is very troubling. The, uh, the two measures that have been put forward in, in finance by uh, is the educational head tax, SB 50, as well as the motor fuel tax that passed out of uh, on the Senate yesterday. The head tax I've mentioned was is still in finance, but what I've seen is, is it boils down to a 1.5 billion dollar um, deficit that we're trying to fill, 
I don't see uh, that we, I see that we are ill-prepared and ha we have no plan to go forward at this point. Uh, that's come from the from governor, from gov the governor's administration to try and deal with this thing. We've got these band-aid type of measures that are being put forward, whether it's the lottery, whether it's the exchange of uh, the PFD for some property, uh, some land in, in Alaska. Uh, I don't see this as a comprehensive way to go ahead and and uh, deal with what's glaring us right, right in, like uh, like a deer in with headlights in his eyes, and so because of that, it's a troubling situation I find ourselves in. Uh, before I turn it over to Senator Keel, I just want to acknowledge that Senator Gray Jackson is in the audience as well. Senator Keel. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Begich. I'm here, of course, to go line by line through all 14 departments in the executive. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I think some of the, the most critical issues uh, on the on the budget are are really issues uh, of principle and of Alaska's future. Uh, the budget that the governor submitted uh, has a net effect of being $30 million less next year for K-12 schools. That's unacceptable. Our schools have been struggling with flat funding as every cost imaginable goes up. Uh, we've got to get at least at the barest minimum uh, that $30 million reinstated so that schools only have to deal with the effects of inflation, especially health care cost inflation, in the coming year. Uh, no kid gets a second shot at their fifth grade year or their senior year because we decided we'd put some more money in next year. It doesn't work like that. We need to make sure that those students all get um, their educational opportunities and the chance to succeed in the coming year. The uh, the House budget currently uh, last year. I think that's very unfortunate. That has, will have a real drag on Alaska's economy. Whether in video restart in MTA stream TV 316 or 1270. Individual options, dialogue, slows, edit, no delivery, button, do, do. In MTA stream TV, 306. Will call the Senate. In MTA stream TV, 316 or 1217 PM, with guide tomorrow. And the chance to succeed in the coming year. The, uh, the House budget currently... Uh, last year. I think that's very unfortunate. That has will have a real drag on Alaska's economy. Whether we're talking about the side of the university system that provides skills training for jobs and workers, or whether we're talking about um, what Ted Stevens called enriched brains that, that uh, support our economy. Uh, disinvestment in the University of Alaska is going to drag down Alaska's future, uh, especially economically, for years to come. I'm pleased to say that the budget as we see it now does make some progress on public safety. Uh, there is some significant progress on state troopers. The next step has to be implementing the recommendations from the BPSO task force so that Alaskans have safe communities everywhere in our state. Uh, and that's just critical. We have a lot of work to do on uh, support for public broadcasting. I think you saw that uh, this last summer when the wildfires were ravaging the state and the governor who had vetoed all of the money for public broadcasting encouraged people in rural Alaska to tune into the radio for updates. Uh, we're certainly going to need uh, good information and the ability to disseminate information around the state as we keep the pul our finger on the pulse of this new virus that's coming around. Uh, and of course, Senator Olson has a, a weather eye on the Department of Law budget for public safety issues. The other place we're making a little progress, of course, is in the transportation budget. Uh, the House has made some reinvestment in the ferry system, which are, is just critical to the economy of coastal Alaska with ripple effects throughout our state. Um, and we've also been talking with our colleagues from up north about making sure that we don't close any more maintenance stations. We repair the one who had a roof fall in that we keep the roads plowed and commerce and Alaskans moving around our state. I think when you put it all together, it just illustrates that we've cut the budget about as far as it can reasonably be cut. I think that you saw that with the governor's supplemental request, acknowledging that most of his, many of his line item vetoes were not responsible and were not achievable. So um, 
The part of this conversation that's been missing so far, as my two colleagues alluded to, is how we pay for it. The governor's budget is uh, a fast track to spending down the last of our savings and leaving the state in a position where we either have to make much deeper cuts than he proposed last year or eliminate the PFD. Neither of those is an acceptable outcome. If we burn the last of our savings this year, those are the choices we're faced with, and that's not an okay place to lead. So we'll work hard with our colleagues for the rest of the session to try and put the state on a sustainable path when we get out of here in May. Thank you, Senator Keel. I, all, all this leads to the same thing. We have to craft a meaningful path to opportunity for all Alaskans, and that's what we're hoping for. Uh, with that, we want to open it up for questions. We know you, you'll have a few, and uh, Becky, and then Andrew. Becky Bohr with the Associated Press. Um, maybe for Senators uh, Begich and Olson. Uh, Senator Begich, first, to what degree have lawmakers been briefed by the administration about the state's preparedness or steps that they're taking regarding the coronavirus. And I wondered, maybe for you and Senator Olson, since he's on finance, if you expect um, what kind of questions, if any, you have about the appropriation that the uh, administration is seeking for that, and if you expect that to cause any heartburn or in, in any way. I, I think, thank you for that question. I'm going to answer it first by, by saying I, I really appreciate that you brought that up, and I want to emphasize some of the contact I've had with the governor and the governor's office and some of what's coming up here. I think that it's important for us to know. And if I could just say that is primarily why we absolutely have to have a known budget, because we have emergencies that happen. It was fires last year. Now we are facing COVID-19 and the impact of that uh, potential pandemic on the state. And we just really don't have the luxury to hope that we won't have emergencies. The Kivalina fire is another example of that. But um, as early as uh, two weeks ago, the administration presented the Health and Social Services Committee with a very in-depth uh, walkthrough on the efforts that were going on with COVID uh, to address the what was then called the coronavirus. And just, I think, the next day it changed to COVID-19, it was called. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, that um, at that time we were told by uh, uh, um, Ms. Zink, that Dr. Zink, that the... Uh, be as late as March 10th before you would get testing kits up here. I've been assured by the chief of staff as of Sunday that those that availability has been approved by the CDC and that we have the capacity to begin testing in Alaska now, which is critically important given how close the Seattle hub is to all of us in Alaska and knowing that that is where the, the if you will, the epicenter, and I say that with hand quotes, but where the epicenter of the virus seems to be located in the United States today. That's critical to us. This is a, That's one stop away from Juneau, for example. We also, as you know, have been kept informed about the cruise ship that's moving towards Juneau. It has four to 500 crew, all of whom, and we've been assured by the administration, have tested clear of the virus, so we're aware of that. As uh, said, tomorrow the administration is going to provide the full legislature uh, an entire briefing on where we are with the state, but we are, I believe that the administration has done a good effort in keeping us informed. As to the budget particulars, I haven't looked at those yet. I know that Senator Olson has begun to look at them, so I'll turn it over to Senator Olson for the remainder of the question. Becky, thank you very much for this up-to-date uh, question that's in the forefront of, forefront of our minds, because as a medical doctor, it's very difficult to go ahead and watch somebody exsanguinate from some type of viral disease that we don't have a good handle on. And let's be, let's be for, truthful, Juno, Alaska in particular, and, and for that reason, and for that, as a, for a matter, matter of fact, Alaska for that is essentially a suburb of Seattle. And Seattle, as was pointed out by Senator Begich, is the epicenter of what's happening in northwest Alaska related to the COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 is one of those things we we are, I think, ill-prepared for. I think the governor has put forward some possibilities that are out there, but it's only a matter of time before it gets up here because of the cruise ship industry that's going to be coming into Juneau here in the very near future, as well as the three or four flights a day that we get from just here in Juneau from Seattle. Uh, and Seattle is a, a, inter, a major international hub on the West Coast, and that's... Uh, a place where we expect to find the virus. As far as our preparedness goes, I would say we're ill-prepared for anything like that. We don't have people that, or we don't have a place for uh, people to to be quarantined. We don't have uh, guidelines to go ahead and say that 
this is what we, this is what is, are the parameters we're going to have to quarantine uh, people. Uh, and I don't I, I, I see to see that there's a long ways to go before we're adequately prepared. And Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Media and KTOO. Um, for, for all of you, uh, would you vote for changing the PFD formula if the Senate isn't passing other revenue measures that are larger than the motor fuel and education head taxes? I uh, can speak for myself on this matter, not for the caucus, and I'll then ask my two colleagues to also speak. I'll go to Senator Olson next and then to Sen Senator Keel. Um, I did last year, I supported a change in the formula last year, and I believe we're going to have to change the formula whether we do or don't get other measures. I think changing the formula and the formula alone places the entire burden on the state citizens, and I think that's a mistake. But we have to have revenue, Andrew, and I'm not willing to uh, eradicate education, eradicate our response to health care crises, uh, eradicate our health and safety net in exchange for uh, a statutory dividend. I'm not going to do that. That said, I also believe that there's interest from the majority in the Senate and the majority in the House to look at oil and gas, at least to some degree, and that's why I put uh, my Senate bill on the um, property tax issue forward. It addresses the question of stability and how we do it. It's, uh, easy, it's an easy give for all of us to do. Uh, secondarily, that's why I do support Senator Bishop's education head tax because that actually captures some of that 21% of those who are employed outside of the state of Alaska, I mean employed in Alaska but live outside of the state of Alaska, captures some of their income. Um, I have said in the past that I would hope that the House would consider modifications to that. In discussions I've had with House leaders, some have indicated an interest in doing that. That could increase that amount of money. Um, and quite frankly, I'm hoping that somehow, some way, uh, uh, an income tax measure is is once again put on the table. And I say that because it's different than it was two weeks ago, Andrew. Two weeks ago, people didn't know that we were going to be suffering from under $50 a barrel oil. Two weeks ago, people didn't expect to see the, uh, you know, three and a half, three, three and a half, four percent of the permanent fund erased in a week. And those are things that underscore the need for stability and to have a broad base. I also believe that this, at least in my discussions with the Senate majority, that they're never going to go along with uh, maintaining the dividend at its current statutory level. Uh, they'll, they'll never go along with an income tax if we maintain the dividend at the current statutory level. And the reason for that is this argument that you take some money in and then you just immediately use it to pay money out. I don't particularly believe that that's the calculus we should be using. I think that's false calculus. That said, I recognize that um, the intensity of that argument, and uh, my hope is remains the same, that we'll have a dividend that's sustainable in the long run, not based on a 1982 law, that we have, uh, and, and ideally in the Constitution, that we'll have a, a fair and non-abusive use of the permanent fund earnings, locked in law, if not the Constitution, and that we have smaller revenue measures to help support that process, including oil and gas contributions to the budget. Right now they're contributing nothing. Senator Olson. Thank you, Senator. Nothing Peter. new, I should say. Okay. Sorry. Sure. Well, certainly my stance has been the full permanent fund dividend for all, all those recipients that are out there that are expecting it. They've gotten, uh, have made plans about uh, their lifestyle related to that. So whatever it takes to go ahead and make sure we have that full. And that's one thing I do uh, agree with the governor on, although I've got a lot of other things I don't agree with him on. We do try to make sure that uh, the permanent fund dividend uh, has has been uh, put to those people that are out there. Because right now, what I see is that the state's fiscal deficit is being essentially paid for by every single Alaskan that's a recipient of the permanent fund dividend. Uh, they seem that in the recent past, they, we've seen our dividends cut in half. We have seen our services disappear. Things like the university has... Uh, has been stripped of its valuable resources. Educational opportunities have been diminished in public radio. And my, it's so important in my district has uh, essen been essentially zeroed out. And so because of that, I am out there in full support of, of a full permanent fund dividend. And, you know, with, with 60 legislators, I mean, there's probably 65 different plans for the permanent fund. Um, I, you know, the, I don't love taking the same number of dollars from every Alaskan. 
right? My household of four has two incomes. We do okay. But I've got constituents where there's a single parent with three kids. To take the same number of dollars from that household as from mine isn't right. We have a math problem, right? To get to the billions of dollars we need, it's the only way it's going to work. But we can't close. It isn't appropriate to close the entire gap on the backs of Alaskans only, and especially on the backs of lower-income Alaskans like that. So some reduction in the PFD I have voted for, I can support. Eliminating the PFD to close our budget gap, I think would be wrong. And that's that's the path we're on if we don't take some other revenue measures. That's what I'm afraid of. You know, uh, we took a little step the other day with a small user fee for, for highways. Uh, that will help a little bit. But we need to look at serious revenue measures to close a serious budget gap. It has to be a balanced approach with additional contributions from the oil industry, with some sort of broad-based tax so that non-residents make a contribution so that there's some kind of connection between a healthy economy and the things we need a government to do so that we have a healthy economy. Because the only thing more regressive than those hits on the PFD are proposals to cut Medicaid and K-12 schools. Last question. Shana. Shana Crandall, Alaska Education Update. I have a question for Senator Olson. The Senate Finance Committee heard Senate Bill 6 last week and just wondering your thoughts on the bill. I think Senate Bill 6 is uh, is a good bill. I think it's one of those things that uh, uh, is going to have positive things that happen to the state of Alaska, especially in rural districts where, uh, although it's going to be hard to go ahead and do, uh, it has the ability to go ahead and make it so that really, which is one of those essential, one of the three R's that are out there, is necessary for uh, those students to go ahead and get ahead and try to make up for uh, some of the things that they were maybe at a disadvantage of and not being exposed to a lot of educational type uh, uh, programs or opportunities that are out there to go ahead and excel once they get out of uh, grade school and on into college or to vocational school for that matter. Uh, uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you for not asking me that question. <laughs> so, with that, uh, we'll call the Senate Minority Press availability over, and we're always available for questions afterwards. Thanks for all for tuning in. Don't forget to share. Facebook squeals on you if you don't share. We definitely got to hear from the Senate minority that uh, they uh, just outright believe that our PFD is theirs to spend on the special interests of Alaska to keep throwing money at K through 12, which is ranked 50th in the nation for a failed education. And they are number one for spending of state money for those 50th in the nation results. We have more people that are failing in our state. We are under on a lot of the scores and statistics, 50% of the nation when our, we're being tested. It is just unbelievable that they could think that they just need to throw more money in. Since 2014, we've had roughly 60,000 people that have been shoved into poverty in this state because of these laws that they are continuing to pass because of the subsidiaries of the monies that they are stealing to keep pushing into the special interests. The Medicaid expansion that was unilaterally passed by Governor Walker which has costed our state nearly a billion dollars a year more in expenses. That great boon took a whole bunch of people that were supposed to get onto Obamacare and shoved them right directly into the Medicaid program. Currently, we have 225,000 Alaskans. You heard right, 225,000 Alaskans. That is one-third of our population living on welfare in our state. Before Obamacare, before 2014, we had roughly 160,000 people living in poverty in our state that was living off of welfare. 160 to 225,000. Let's give you a news flash. We've also, or currently population wise, lost more people living in our state than what we had when this all started, when Obamacare was first passed. Very first day it ever got passed. So just to give you another concept of what's going on, the federal share for Obamacare or 
the Medicaid expansion, the payment that the federal government is paying, that will be decreasing this year. That means the state budget for Department of Health and Social Services is going to increase. Our bill last year for that department was $3.6 billion. They're going to take that $3.6 billion and they want to roll it into the future of what Alaska is going to look like to be even more. We're going to look at $3.5, $3.6, $3.7, $3 $3.8 billion this next year. Do not be shocked when they say they need another $100, $200, $300 million to cover the bill next year because they do not have the money to, to cover it all. Every year they've had to appropriate in a supplemental budget and pull an extra $100 million a year in or more to cover the Medicaid expansion and the cost that ha has incurred upon our state. Don't forget to share. Facebook squeals on you if you don't share. I hope you guys all have a great day.